So every year, billions of animals are caged, used, abused, and killed. And behind every one of these animals who suffers is a corporation that is profiting. And this means that there's a corporation that we can target with a campaign. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about tools and strategies that you can use when campaigning against companies and demanding that they change practices that exploit animals. I currently run global campaigns for the Open Wing Alliance, a coalition of over 70 animal rights organizations working to end the egregious abuse of chickens worldwide. This is a photo from a recent campaign that we ran demanding that Hilton go cage-free globally, a campaign that lasted less than 24 hours. The tools and strategies that I'm going to discuss can be applied to any type of activism, whether you're campaigning for cage-free or campaigning against the fur industry, animal circuses, or vivisection. By adopting a coordinated and strategic approach, we can dramatically increase our impact. I've been doing animal rights activism for about 12 years now. And in my early days, I did a bit of everything. I campaigned against animal circuses, against the fur industry, against vivisection, against horse meat, and everything in between. In those early days, I was fueled mainly by passion and anger, and less by a ruthless strategic plan that would yield results. My most successful um, campaign from my early days was a foie gras campaign that I ran in my hometown. Within just a few months, the fledgling animal rights group that I was a part of got over a dozen restaurants to immediately remove foie gras from their menu. We were a brand new group and I was brand new to activism and this felt like a huge and successful win. We felt powerful and unstoppable. As a brand new group, we were suddenly getting media coverage and new volunteers without even trying. And we were getting restaurants to do what we wanted with very little effort. Most of these restaurants caved just with the threat of protests, while most of the other ones only needed one or two protests to seal the deal. The initial high of this campaign didn't last long, though. One of our key organizers got arrested for criminal mischief based on fabricated accusations from a restaurant owner. In addition to exorbitant legal fees, this um, organizer was also banned from 100 meters within any uh, restaurant that sold foie gras. So effectively, the judge in this case banned him from being in the downtown area of our town and also kept him far away from our campaign. And then we encountered a stubborn target, a restaurant that wasn't phased by our protests with owners who seemed to delight in mocking us uh, and restaurant goers who were extremely apathetic. We protested at this restaurant that sold foie gras twice a week for months, and every week our numbers shrank, and every week our target grew more accustomed to our very limited toolkit of tactics. And if all of that weren't demoralizing enough for a new animal rights group to be going through, the rest of the restaurant industry in my town also started to take notice of our stalled campaign. They no longer saw the momentum behind our initial campaign actions or the power behind the work we were doing. Instead, they saw how small and underfunded we were. They saw how static our campaign was, that our tactics never really changed. And they saw how just a little perseverance on their part could stifle us. And so while we were stuck in this campaign, lacking the experience to push it to the next level, we saw our previous campaign targets quietly put foie gras back on the menu. They knew that we couldn't run 13 campaigns at once, and now they also knew how to beat us. All they had to do was wait. So fast forward a few years from when I was 14 to when I was 17, and had just been introduced to Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, which outlines 13 power tactics that activists can use when running pressure campaigns. At the time, I was living in an activist house with three other activists, planning out a campaign to shut down a fur store in Canada. At the time that we were planning this campaign, there were a handful of other campaigns against fur stores in North America. Campaigns run by groups with more experience, with more money and resources, more connections. But those campaigns had also been going on for years without much effect. And so we hoped that maybe we could do something different. The planning behind our campaign was meticulous and it was carried out mercilessly. We outreached to every person in the neighborhood surrounding that first store, effectively turning all of the owner's neighbors against him. Every lamppost got a poster, every house got a leaflet and a conversation with us. We stood outside that first store every single day that they were open for every hour that they were open. And keep in mind that this was during a Canadian winter, so it was chilly to say the least, um, and 
we juggled to stay warm. Over the course of that campaigning, we had nearly 50 police visits, but not a single charge or a single arrest. This time we knew what we were doing. We filmed every interaction that we had with the customers, with the owners, and with the police. And because of the initial outreach we had done, the residents in this neighborhood were on our side. Even though we were screaming into megaphones all day, every day, in a residential neighborhood, they didn't call the police on us. And within just three months, a group of four unemployed, unfunded activists won Canada's first ever campaign to successfully shut down a first door. Kaufman Furs became the School of Rock. This was my first ever truly successful campaign. And it was a success because the approach was entirely different from what I'd done in the past. It was thoroughly planned, it was focused and unrelenting, and every tactic and decision was carried out strategically. Nowadays, I get to target bigger players like Marriott, Hilton, Subway, and Starbucks. And the issues that I'm campaigning for are different. But regardless of that, the underlying principles behind my campaigns are still the same. I'm going to use Sololinsky's Rules for Radicals as a framework to explain how my activism shifted from a passionately erratic, but ultimately ineffective style to one that systematically wins results. The first rule that Sololinsky gives us is, power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Our power comes not only from the resources and the people that we actually have within our organization or within our movement. It also comes from what our targets think of us, how big they think we are, how powerful they think we are. And that means that we need to pay attention to what our targets think of us and how we can make ourselves seem even more powerful. So what does this look like practically? First, it means that we pick appropriate tactics. If you only have five people and aren't able to do a media-worthy demonstration, then choose a tactic where five people is enough to make a large impression. We want to emphasize the power that we have, not what we lack. It also means we need to be coordinated. A small group of activists can run an overwhelming and relentless campaign with huge success, while a rally with hundreds of people can go completely unnoticed. We need to identify our strengths and then mobilize around those. We also need to communicate. You could be the most terrifying foe, but if you can't find ways to communicate your strengths to your target, then they won't know to be afraid of you. So we need to figure out where we're strongest and then find ways to communicate and demonstrate that. If you have a large base of supporters, for example, you could ask all of them to each take a small, quick action to show how many people you have behind you. One of the OWA's member groups, Gaia in Belgium, did this for a recent campaign against Best Western. They asked their entire mailing list to each mail key executives at Best Western. And within a couple of days, those executives had each received nearly 10,000 emails. If you don't have those sort of numbers behind you, which many of us don't, uh, you could instead ask your very excited and engaged group of volunteers to take more hard-hitting actions, like phoning key executives every single day or working in shifts to stage constant mini-protests. And finally, for this rule, we need to get close. If we lack the people, the numbers, the resources, or the media connections, we need to get physically closer to our targets. It's easier for them to spot our weaknesses when we're far away and they can see the full picture. So kindly get right in their face. You could shut down their headquarters with a perfectly legal protest of just a few people, while hundreds of people doing a protest 30 minutes away could be completely unnoticed. You can invest a lot of time and money putting up a billboard, but unless it's on an executive's way to work, they may not notice or care. Rule number two, never go outside the expertise of your people. It will take less time and be more impactful to organize an action that you already know how to do well. And when we're doing tactics that we already know how to do confidently, we look far more intimidating to our opponents than when we're disorganized and unsure of ourselves. So let's imagine that you have to make a meal to impress somebody. And let's say you're really good at making spaghetti. Even though it's pretty basic and straightforward, your spaghetti is foolproof and it's delicious. If you had a month to prepare to make this meal, it might make sense to try your hand at something more complicated and impressive, like a vegan souffle. But if you had to make this dinner tonight, 
it would be a mistake to make that souffle. It would take loads more time, there's a higher chance of it being a complete failure, and best case scenario, you're probably only going to make a mediocre version of that recipe. The same holds true in our activism. We should absolutely work to expand our range of expertise, but at the end of the day, we should also lean into what we're good at and avoid taking risks when the stakes are high and eyes are on us. When I was 15, I was campaigning against Huntington Life Sciences, one of the world's largest um, contract animal testing labs and also notorious animal abuser. And at the time, I wanted to be a more confident and articulate um, representative for that campaign. So I picked up a copy of Sacred Cows and Golden Geese, which is a book that talks about all the ways in which animal testing is not only ineffective, but also harmful to human health. So I sat down with this book and a highlighter intent to memorize everything in this book. And one frustrating chapter in, I had highlighted about 90% of the words um, and retained maybe 2% of them. This was not my area of expertise. I was loud behind a megaphone and I was great at talking to the public, but I was not and I am not a scientist. And while I absolutely could have worked to expand this knowledge base and this skill set, oftentimes it makes better sense to play to your strengths, especially if there are other people who are better equipped to take on a particular challenge. In this case, everyone in my animal rights group was trying to memorize the exact same information and none of us were doing a particularly good job of it. So in a campaign, seek out the expertise of people who know what they're doing and avoid pretending to be an expert when you're not. Rule number three, whenever possible, go outside the expertise of your enemy. Our targets are comfortable in boardrooms, in legal fights, and in staged press conferences. So let's not play into their hands. Our targets are uncomfortable with grassroots action. They're uncomfortable with speaking from an emotional place. We aren't going to beat them with spreadsheets and cost analyses. We're going to beat them with pictures of sad chickens. We want our targets to be stressed, frazzled, and more likely to make mistakes. For all of the reasons that we want to stay within our expertise, we want to, whenever possible, take them outside of theirs. And beyond not playing to our opponent's strengths, we also want to pay attention to their past experience with campaigns and with activists. If they've been targeted by a campaign before, we need to make sure that our campaign feels different. And that's especially important if previous campaigns were ultimately unsuccessful. Rule number four, make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. No company or individual is perfect. Companies routinely set ideals and standards that they do not meet. And this failure on their part prevents, presents us with an opportunity to point out their hypocrisy. If a company claims to be a leader in corporate social responsibility, point out unethical practices in factory farming and um, all of the other competitors in that industry who are making progress on this issue. If they position themselves as innovative and cutting edge, highlight how outdated animal cruelty is. If a company prides itself on customer service, publicly question why it is that they're ignoring their customers' calls for higher animal welfare. This approach is most fun when a company has set principles or procedures that we can exploit tactically. If they have a rule that every shareholder is given a voice at their meetings, then you can buy up some stock and take advantage of the opportunity that they've given you. If a university has to honor the results of a student referendum, you can use that as a way around decision makers who would never take a stance against vivisection. If a CEO's claim to fame is that he answers his phone personally, then drive in hundreds of phone calls. In December of last year, the Open Wing Alliance ran a campaign against Marriott International, the world's largest hospitality company. Marriott has an internal policy where they need to respond to every single customer complaint that they receive, whether it comes in by email, online form, Facebook Messenger, or social media comment. Our campaign lasted less than 48 hours. That's how long it took to create what Marriott called a PR nightmare and for us to drive in thousands of customer complaints that they needed to respond to individually. Rule number five, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. And for all the other feminists in this room, this rule also works well for women. Everyone cares about themselves. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, 
because we can use it to our advantage in campaigns. We have to remember that at the end of the day, the decision makers at these companies are people, and they care more about themselves than they do about the company that employs them. People want to be praised and celebrated. People do not want to be criticized, especially publicly. In our campaigns, we work to create an environment where a CEO might say to himself, I don't want to be associated with this cruelty. And if I can change my company policy to protect my name, then I'm going to. We give leadership an easy choice to make. Adopt the policy or campaign ask that we want and the ridicule stops. Don't adopt the campaign ask and risk further reputation damage. In this phase of a campaign, we move away from just targeting the company and we start targeting the people who work there because people hurt faster than faceless corporations. See, a CEO will jump from one company to the next over the course of their career. At the end of the day, their reputation is what matters most to them. So during a ridicule stage of a campaign, we will comment on executives and employees' public Twitter pages. If they're speaking at an event, we'll show up and we'll cause a ruckus. And one of my favorite tactics, we will buy website domains with an executive's name as the URL and then create a website around that. Here's an example outside of McDonald's headquarters in the US. On the right-hand side is a cardboard cutout of McDonald's CEO Steve Easterbrook holding a website with, uh, holding a laptop with the website steveeasterbrooksecrets.com. I found that executives and leadership hate public criticism more than anything else. It suddenly makes apathetic people invested in the outcome of our campaign. Board members are also a great pressure point. They have incredible power to make change at a company, and they're not on the payroll in the same, that a, same way that a vice president is. Board members are lending their name to a company in order to amass more power, reputation, and influence. And so if that association isn't serving them anymore, they're going to change the situation so that it does. Rule number six, a good tactic is one your people enjoy. People are our most valuable asset. We will never have as much money or political power as our opponents. Our strengths have to come from elsewhere. You can accomplish a lot with a few really great people and not a whole lot of money. But when you lack the people, it's hard to make up the difference in money. We need our supporters to want to take action. They'll do a better job if they enjoy it. They'll stay active for longer and more likely to take action again. And their enthusiasm will draw more people into our cause and make our campaigns more robust. So it's worthwhile to spend time crafting actions that make your people feel like they're part of something exciting. But if we're being honest, uh, a lot of campaigning doesn't look like this jumping guy. There's a whole lot of boredom and monotony and tedium that goes into every single campaign victory. And while we ideally want our tactics to be novel and exciting, sometimes we have to ask people to do tactics they don't particularly enjoy. We run into this issue during our global campaigns. For our global campaigns, they mainly happen online. We ask thousands of people to take small, quick actions locally and globally against a company. And then we supplement that with select grassroots on the ground actions. So while most of this is unfolding on social media, one of the most important actions we can ask people to take are phone calls to executives. Phone calls are quick and easy. They're cheap or completely free and they are incredibly disruptive. While a company can filter out emails from us so that they never even have to read them, they simply can't do that with phone calls. We're either disrupting an executive, taking time away from their secretary, or we're filling up their voicemail with hundreds of calls that they need to sift through. Unfortunately though, volunteers in my experience tend to hate making phone calls. So how do we make an important action that people don't enjoy into something that they do enjoy. First, we define and explain the impact. I find that people are far more willing to take an action when they understand how it fits into our larger strategy. So for phone calls, for example, I want volunteers to understand that these calls are disruptive and that a company will cave to our demands because we are disruptive. Companies make commitments either to protect their reputation or because we're really annoying and they don't want to talk to us anymore. 
So we aim to be annoying and we aim to be disruptive. Next, you also want to provide examples and support. The easier we make an action to take, the more likely people are to take it. So give your people everything that they need, all of the information, all of the tools that they need to carry out an action as quickly and efficiently as possible. For phone calls, this would include providing them with a spreadsheet of all of the executives' names, phone numbers, and job titles that I want them to call. It would involve giving them a script so they know exactly what to say and also have answers to common questions and comments that they're going to get from them. And it could also include an audio recorded role play so that they know exactly what they need to do on this phone call and there isn't that fear of the unknown. And finally, if you want a tactic to be more enjoyable and to be fun, encourage people to have fun with it. For phone calls, you could set up a friendly competition to see who can make the most calls. You could ask people to share funny anecdotes of their conversations with executives because there are always some of those. Really, you just want to encourage fun and silliness and personality into every tactic whenever possible. We had an activist last year dress up as Santa Claus and hand out coal at a company's headquarters to executives who had been naughty. And speaking of fun, um, we're almost halfway through this presentation. And I know at this point, energy levels can start to wane and attention spans can start to droop. So we're going to do a really quick energizer um, just to bring us back. So in a moment, not yet, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person beside you and take a moment to curse out a company that you want to beat in a campaign. These curses should be in your own words, but just for some inspiration, they could be things like, fuck Ronald McDonald, down with Evil Corp, or simply KFC, you suck. So I'm going to invite you now to turn to someone beside you and really quickly each say a curse against a company you want to beat with a campaign. All right, well done. I heard some loud voices over here, which is great. Clearly, we have some companies we want to, to destroy with a campaign. Uh, so let's keep talking about how to do that. Rule number seven, a tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. If every week you're asking your activists to take the exact same actions, the same time, same place, they're going to get bored pretty quickly. If you're asking them to do a protest, same time, same place every week, they're going to get bored. Morale will be low. And even if your people are really passionate, there's a limit to how much we can use passion to subsidize boring tactics. And beyond your people being bored, your target is also going to adapt. A manager might be frazzled the first time you show up for a protest but that will quickly become the new normal. And what we need to do is keep them on their toes. So let's say that you attended a company shareholder meeting, covertly distributing literature inside like this activist before being asked to leave. At their next event, they're going to be ready for that tactic. So it wouldn't make sense to use it again. You'll be kicked out much faster. You won't accomplish as much. And I would even argue that redoing that tactic could harm your campaign then your target will feel like they've got you all figured out. They don't need to be scared of you anymore. Instead, we want to come up with new and novel tactics constantly. If you want to reuse that exact same tactic, I would only do so as a decoy to buy you time to pull off something else. Rule number eight, keep the pressure on. When I was younger, I bounced around a lot from one issue and one campaign to the next. Friday night was a foie gras protest. Saturday afternoon was a circus demonstration. Sunday was an anti-vivisection action. Monday was a protest at the Korean embassy against dog meat. And one of the biggest lessons that I learned is that one-off protests do not make a campaign, and rarely do they result in much real change. We need to create constant and sustained pressure on our targets. If the pressure dies down, becomes manageable or predictable, our target is going to assume that they can just wait us out. We need to make it clear to them that this is not an issue that will go away without action on their part. Rule number nine, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. This is just basic human psychology. We wanna get our targets worrying in their heads about all of the ways that we may be negatively impacting them and their business. They can dream up worst case scenarios far better than we can. 
So it's important that we give them the time and space to visit those dark places in their minds. Before we launch any campaign, we always try to talk with companies. We have what's called a corporate outreach team, and their job is to try to set up meetings with potential targets. At those meetings, they'll talk about all the reasons why they should care about an issue and all the other progress that's happening in an industry. But when that isn't enough incentive, they'll also show them what our campaigns involve. And in that way, we use this rule to win campaigns without ever having to run them. Most of our campaign victories come from our corporate relations team who is just talking to companies, not even running a campaign. And then during a campaign that you actually do have to run, warn your target of every major action that's to come. A couple weeks into a campaign, I'll send them an email telling them that I'm going to start running online ads. And I'll attach a screenshot of those ads. And then hopefully the company commits before I even have to run an ad. A couple weeks later, I'll send them an email letting them know that I'm going to start contacting their business partners. I won't tell them which partners. They can imagine that for themselves. But again, hopefully they do it without me even having to put in that work. If done well, this, ta this strategy or this rule allows us to double our impact, where they have to live through the worst case scenario in their minds, and then also reality that is hopefully even worse than what they'd imagined. Keep in mind that you should only use this rule to warn targets about actions that they can't protect against. So it would be a mistake to say that you're going to be at their next franchise recruitment event distributing leaflets in the bathroom, because they can protect against that and prevent you from doing it. Similarly, if I'm working to get a billboard put up, I will absolutely tell a company about that, because if I can save several thousand dollars, then that's a good idea. Um, and I'll attach artwork so they know what this billboard is going to look like. But I won't tell them exactly where it's going to be, when it's going to launch, or what ad company we're working with, because then they can work to get that ad pulled. This rule can be one of our greatest strengths in a campaign, because as I said, it can double our impact. It can also be one of our greatest weaknesses in a longer campaign, though. So if you're, you're in trouble if your target starts to see that you're not following through on your threats, or starts to see that the reality is never as bad as what they'd feared. Rule number 10. The major premise for tactics is the development of operations that will maintain a constant pressure upon the opposition. This one's a little bit of a mouthful. Basically, you can't expect to win quickly, and we need to organize in a way that is sustainable long term. If you have a $5,000 budget to spend on an entire campaign, it would be a mistake to spend most of that in the first week of actions. Even though we want to win quickly, we need to be ready for a marathon, not a sprint. And often for our targets, it is scarier to see us ramping up rather than doing one large push where then momentum dies down. When we're ramping up, our targets start worrying about how far this campaign's going to go and how long it's going to last. So before you even launch a campaign, take time to plan and prepare. Have weeks of actions ready to go before you launch so that when the campaign is actually running, you're not bogged down with those small details of day-to-day -day work. You can focus on bigger picture projects, on more intensive actions, and on actions that are more tailored to your target's vulnerabilities. Because that's information that you only know when you're really running a campaign. Early on in your campaign, you want to develop systems that will naturally help you maintain pressure. And there's a lot of different things that this can look like. But I think a good example is what we call modular materials. So within our campaigns, we have a template for leaflets, websites, and videos ready to go so that when we want to launch a secondary campaign against a company's business partner, that campaign can be launched within a couple of hours. All of the work has already been put into it. This rule is also about efficiency. So pay attention to pain points in your campaign or places where things feel like they're not ideal. Those can be indicators that you want to automate your processes a bit or refine how you do things. Rule number 11. If you push a negative hard and deep enough, it will break through into its counterside. Sometimes our targets do things that are so morally repugnant that it causes the average apathetic person to suddenly be sympathetic to our cause. Sometimes our targets will do things in public that show their true colors. When I was running the fur campaign that I described earlier, one of the customers, who was very angry, 
uh, purposely drove his car into one of our activists who was standing on the sidewalk. At a circus protest, a, an employee came over and punched one of our activists in the face. While I was doing outreach at Ribs Fest, arguably not the best place to do it, um, vendors threw rocks at us while we walked through. In all these situations, thankfully no one was seriously hurt. And while ideally activists wouldn't be targeted with violence of any kind, it does create a compelling narrative that we can use to our advantage. Rule number 12, the price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. You need to make your campaign ask clear, actionable, and relatively realistic. Ultimately, you can't win a campaign if you don't know exactly what it is that you want from your target. If your enemy is willing to cave to your demands, you need to be able to provide them with a clear road, roadmap for implementation. Companies will try to weasel their way out of any commitment that they make, which was the case with the foie gras campaign that I ran a long time ago. So in the same way that a lawyer will draw up ironclad legal agreements, we need to make sure that our campaign asks are strong and don't have loopholes that they can exploit. Rule number 13, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. When you're choosing a target, you want to choose an impactful target. When I'm deciding which company to launch a campaign against, I want to find a sweet spot in terms of difficulty. I don't want to go for the, the easiest um, company within an industry, because although that campaign will be quick and easy, it also won't really do anything. A commitment from them will be ignored by the rest of the industry. Similarly, I also don't want to choose the hardest target, because although a victory from them would be incredible, that campaign could also take years to run and bottomless resources. What I want to find is a target that is precedent setting, but also attainable. And then after a few of those types of campaigns with targets that mean something, but are doable, you'll have enough momentum to take on the biggest, toughest players with relative ease. In addition to choosing an impactful target, you also want to be really clear about who it is that you're targeting. Because everybody is going to try to pass off responsibility to somebody else. Nobody ultimately wants to be responsible for animal cruelty in their company. So be really specific about what company or branch within a company, and then what decision makers you're targeting. So after you've picked your impactful target, you then want to freeze it. You want to focus on it. You want to become completely obsessed with it, start having nightmares and dreams about it. And then after you've won that campaign, you can move on to your next target. Switching from one target to the next or one campaign to the next without first winning is a folly approach. It sets a bad precedent that companies can just wait us out. It means that you never actually gain momentum, so you're never actually able to take on those tougher players down the road. And it also means that your people don't get to experience wins and celebrate those, which is really important for sustainable activism. Jumping around from one target to the next used to define my activism. Um, and I think this is a natural consequence of all of us being so passionate that we want to give some of our attention and time to every issue that we care about. But we're not going to achieve the results that we can unless we're laser focused and really commit. After you've picked your target, become obsessed with it, now you want to personalize it. There's a reason that stories about heroes and villains and good guys and bad guys are so compelling. It's easier for the media, for our supporters, and for the public to understand an issue when we frame it as black and white. We also need to remember that our target is not just the company. Our target is also the people who work at that company, the decision makers who are responsible for ending our campaign. Because again, People hurt faster than faceless corporations. When we know who the decision makers are, we target them personally. And finally, you want to polarize the campaign. First, you want to polarize the company within their industry. You want to frame them as a bad apple in an industry and a world that is moving away from animal cruelty. And then you want to polarize them internally. You want to turn all of their supporters against them. So first, you can turn employees against leadership. Because the average employee cares about how animals are treated. It's the decision makers at the top who care more about profits and the bottom line than they do about animals. 
So work to sow division and chaos within a company by turning employees against the leadership. If a company is franchised, you can also turn franchise owners and franchise buyers against the company. You can tell franchise owners that the head of franchise sales is not taking this issue seriously and is jeopardizing their investment. We used to think that franchises were a hindrance to campaigns, and now they are honestly a great thing because there are some more people to help us apply pressure. Similarly, when a CEO serves as a board member at another company, run a secondary campaign against that company and then make them resent him for bringing them into the campaign. And ideally, we also want the people in an executive social circle to help us apply pressure. Solinsky's Rules for Radicals is one framework that you can use when running campaigns. And it's just that it's a framework, it's not set in stone. So you can take these rules, adapt them, and make them your own. I can guarantee with fair certainty, though, that implementing an approach like this will make a difference in your activism. And it will help you to take down giants. For me, campaigns are all about figuring out what our strengths are and then leveraging those to secure a win. They're about identifying our target's weaknesses and then exploiting those mercilessly. Campaigns are about figuring out how executives think and what they care about and then doing everything that we can to get under their skin. These rules are one way to guide that thinking process. I can't emphasize enough how crucial it is that we employ a calculated and deliberate approach to campaigns. Since I was 14, there's nothing that I've cared more about in life than helping animals. Like all of you, I would do anything or give up anything if it meant that animals could be freed from lives of abuse and exploitation. And yet for me, passion and selflessness weren't enough. They had to be matched with strategy and efficacy. Passion and selflessness alone led me down a reactionary path that didn't yield tangible results. It gave me the energy to stand in the freezing cold and the pouring rain shutting into a megaphone, but it didn't give me the pragmatism to question what tactics and approaches were most effective. It's hard to put into words how devastating and crushing it is to look back on years of effort and not see much outcome from it. I've always needed to be doing something to try to help animals, but I've often questioned whether my activism served any purpose beyond soothing my need for action, my need to be doing something. And because of this, I struggled with shattering burnout for many years. Strategic and effective action changed that for me. It gave me a lens through which to analyze and assess my activism. It encouraged thoughtful reflection, facilitated hard-hitting action, and ultimately helped me make measurable progress. In my early years, I made a whole lot of mistakes. Um, and I'm confident that I'm still making mistakes every day. But rules like this help me to learn from them and make fewer. I am confident that if I were standing outside that foie gras restaurant, like I was many years ago, that campaign would have been conceived of differently, carried out differently, and would not have left my animal rights group feeling weak and defeated. Strategy has increased my impact. With the right tools, we can save more animals. And that's why we're all here, to save as many animals as possible. Thank you.